Hello everyone and welcome to the latest IGP webinar. My name is Zach Tomsky, I'm a journalist at Clarion Gaming, writing for iGaming Business as well as our sister sites, IGP North America and IGP 365. The title of today's webinar is Biometrics in Gaming, is this the future of player protection and verification and is it being held in, and is being held in partnership with innovative technology. Uh, for those who aren't aware, biometrics are the use of biological markers such as facial recognition or fingerprints to validate and identify individuals. Today is going to be a deep dive into the topic as it relates to gaming, looking at how the technology can be utilized within the sector in a variety of different contexts, including for age verification. We'll begin, we'll begin at a more technical end of the spectrum, discussing issues associated with algorithms and the data themselves that underpin the technology, before moving on to the regulatory environment and how it's changing. Uh, we'll then consider how to prevent spoofing and other attempts to fool the sensors before moving on to the future of the technology writ large. Despite their inherent utility, the implementation of biometrics is not without its challenges. These issues can range from the more political, such as questions over privacy and combating bias, to more mundane sets of considerations, such as spoofing, as well as internet and Wi-Fi issues. Um, just before I hand over to the panel, um, our session today is being recorded and will be available shortly after the end of the webinar from iGamingBusiness.com. Uh, as audience members, you'll also be able to ask any questions using the Q&A section on the right hand of your screen. Uh, please keep an eye out uh, as there you can vote to thumb up questions that are posted, make it more likely we'll be able to get around to asking them, uh, to answering them. Um, now, um, just to begin, um, we're going to do a quick poll, um, which is, um, have you considered implementing biometric technology um, in your business? Okay. Um, um, so that should come up at the uh, top right of your screen. Um, now, while that's going on, um, uh, I'll just ask everyone on the panel to briefly introduce themselves so that we can get started. Um, uh, would you like to get started, uh, Tony, and um, briefly introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Alton. I'm, uh, my name's Tony Allen. I am Chief Executive of the Age Check Certification Scheme. Uh, we are a global uh, accredited certification body. Um, our role is to test that identity and age check systems work. We don't actually produce any. We are a, a, an independent test house and uh, hoping to contribute to the work we've done on testing of uh, biometric systems and age estimation systems, uh, including some of them that are represented around the, uh, around the table. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Peter Murray, do you want to go next? Yep, just to confuse everybody, there's two Peters on the call. But uh, yeah, my name is Peter Murray. I head up the gaming team here at Verif. Uh, we do global authentication technology uh, and specialize in the biometric uh, arena as opposed to the data first approach. So it's document verification, facial recognition. So yeah, really interested in the discussion and, and, and the testing and the adoption that's going on around the industry. And uh, now, uh, Peter Hannibal, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter Hannibal. I'm CEO of the Gambling Business Group, uh, which is a trade body who um, work with governments and regulators, both national and uh, local, uh, on on improving the uh, the business environment for uh, predominantly land-based gambling. And some of the work we do is in creating industry standards and protocols for or technologies, common technologies. Thanks, Zach. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, Fiona, would you like to say something? Yeah, hi guys, um, I'm Fiona. I work with Aspire Global. I head up their compliance and I'm the MLRO. Um, we're a B2B um, provider, platform provider, and we can offer um, all turnkey solutions for our clients. Um, and we do um, sports book um, and casino as well. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Zach. Um, afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew O'Brien. I'm a product manager at Innovative Technology. Um, essentially, we head up the biometrics team. So we produce biometric solutions that can be used for age estimation, um, facial recognition, and all forms of facial analysis. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, uh, I thought we'd certainly have a presentation to share with us. Um, uh, would you like to do that? Yeah, let me remember my instructions. Let's 
So let's wait for it to load up. So I hope everyone can see, now see my slides. So it's a very, very quick overview of um, the discussion today, rather than any kind of debt by PowerPoint. So don't panic. So like I said, we're from Innovative Technology. We have um, our biometric solutions. We have um, created in-house that we'd like to share. My slides have just disappeared. So, sorry, just waiting for the slides to update. So what is biometrics? So as Zach touched on, biometrics is basically body measurements and calculations related to a human characteristic. So it can range from something like measuring some, how someone walks to voice analysis, to looking at people's vascular uh, um, distribution. Um, what we're most familiar with is fingerprints. So we all use our fingerprints mostly our facial recognition to open our phones, um, retina and iris scans, so looking at the, again, um, your retina or your iris, or what we do is facial analysis. So it's a, it's a non-contact form of biometrics. So it essentially just needs a camera. There's no any physical contact that takes place. Again, just wait for it to change. So when we were developing our products, first of all, we went looking for what are the problems out there. And of all the work we've done, I've tried to get it into four small little sound bites. So the first thing was customer or operators would say, I want to in implement a anonymous age estimation in my gaming machine. So I want my customer to come up and I want an, an, an additional barrier to stop them playing if they're underage. So again, I want to help protect my uh, customers. They also wanted to look at being able to confidently identify vulnerable players. So for example, players who may be on a self-excluded list. Again, can we give another safety net to if someone who is on a self-exclusion list attempts to play the game, can we recognize that person? Another one was, I want to build a match um, the face on an ID with the face of the person holding that ID. So can I comfortably link those two together? Again, a safety issue. And this one was kind of a bit left field for us, but again, another interesting application for facial analysis and biometrics is I've got a lot of shiny screens can I get those screens to react to the person in front of the camera? So for example, if I've, I can detect the gender of a person and the age bracket of a person, can I target ads at them? Or I can even flip that. If I have a, a young person in front of the uh, camera, can I make sure and limit what they see? So not, not about just what you see is what you don't show. Um, so that was, Interesting that these are the kind of um, things we've tried to cover and we believe biometrics can help in this. But of course, where there's opportunity, there's always challenges. So once my screen changes. So it doesn't want to seem to change to my last slide. There we go. So of course, there's many challenges as well. Many challenges to get getting these systems trusted and adopted. Um, first one, how do we make sure that they're accurate? So how do I make sure if a 15 year old does walk into my gaming venue that I actually don't allow him to play the game? Um, Within biometrics, you can also have bias. So bias towards gender or skin tone. 
and many other many other boys that can creep into the system so how do we ensure the systems are good and the systems work you have a camera there's always going to be issues and legitimate concerns about data privacy so what are you doing with my data is it private is it safe um we have to have that conversation and that level of transparency in order to gain trust people say you can't you know you know you, you can steal someone's keys you may have to steal someone's passcode password fob card but you can't steal someone's face in theory but you can take a picture of someone and you can use a picture or a video to try to defraud facial analysis systems so there's a lot of concern and again legitimate concerns about how do we ensure that that doesn't happen and finally internet connectivity if you have a solution that's based in the cloud and you're in a location that has bad wi-fi or bad connectivity to the internet how do we get around that issue is there things we can do um and i think during this uh, discussion i hope we can touch on many of these and make things a lot clearer to everybody fantastic um thank you very much andrew <clears throat> um now i know um, um i um I said we begin with the more technical side but maybe just uh using this as a jumping off point um uh, as uh, professionals working in this space how do you think about these issues and um do you think there's ways to get around them do you think they can be mitigated what would you say I'm, I'm happy to jump in first if that's uh, uh I, I would i would agree with nearly every, you know with everything andrew said on there i think that the key uh, thing for me and, and we obviously provide technology in this space is around acceptance and adoption and i think a lot of that comes around trust i think if you look at other areas that rather than the gambling sector which has its own particular challenges uh around perceptions and the toxicity of a brand if you like uh, it's increasingly becoming obvious that um, your customers are happy to share data and, and as long as they get their data protected and it's used in the correct way. But I think it's about ease of use and user experience. So I think all those challenges lead around to one basic area, which is around trust, whether you uh, design and deliver it uh, or whether you test it. So I think lots of the points we will discuss as we go through today, I think lead back to that. But those challenges are all there. So, you know, you, you get different ones in the UK that you might get in Africa. Uh, you might get difference online and offline. And those two areas, I think, are merging. But ultimately, it comes down to acceptance and, and adoption. I think each of those fits into there. So from a challenges point of view, there's many. I think we've made big strides on it, uh, but it's nowhere near there yet. And as an industry, we need, I think we need to work together to make sure that's delivered over time. Yeah, and I think working with, with companies that have had exposure within other industries that, that are doing well in this in this field can only support our industry because things have been tried and tested. I think we, we rush sometimes as an industry um, and I think we need to learn from, from what others have done and how, how it's worked or not worked as the case may be. Um, a lot of feedback from our partners is you know how how can we enhance the the onboarding process how can we enhance what we onboard and the traffic that we onboard and i think biometrics could definitely be um uh, an enhancement in that in that area as well and i would agree just sorry my last point is it's a great point about you know my challenge would be is that i'm not sure regulators are at that cutting edge of it i think because of the challenges gambling has uh then Actually, you know, the banks may may well be ahead of us. There's other industries. I think the point's really valid is what are other industries seeing? Uh, because I, we we purport ourselves as technology companies, yet in this particular area, I think generally led by regulation, we're actually a little bit behind. People are very reticent to go down that route, and that's where maybe Tony's aspect of it of testing around that area is so critical yeah. for people adopting it. Yeah, I mean, uh, the testing is, uh, you know, one of the questions that's already been popped, popped in there is about accuracy and testing and, uh, and how, how can you have assurance, and I'm sure we'll come on to deal with the questions um, uh, shortly, but uh, I think I'd like to pick on, on something that Andrew said, which is um, uh, often uh, you, the, the use of biometrics, you're thinking about biometrics in the context of age verification or onboarding or the kind of 
uh, initial uh, contact that you have with that uh, particular customer. But also it's got a really important role in terms of ongoing compliance and assurance. And one very simple example of that is that if you have a, a gaming, uh, uh, an online gaming service on my website, you know, on a phone or on a tablet, uh, we've seen uh, examples of uh, your hand geometry. Uh, so that's how far you can move your fingers apart, which is a type of biometrics being used as a contraindicator that a child may be playing that game. It's no good for telling whether you're not you're an adult or a, or a child. It's not that accurate, but it's good enough to say, actually, the person who's playing this game is probably only about six years old because all they can do is this with their fingers. And that contraindicator can then lead gaming to uh, trip out into a, uh, well, we just need to check out who's playing this game. We just need to uh, uh, re-verify or authenticate that you're the right person for this uh, account holder. And that's a way, a very soft way, a very privacy-preserving way, and a very um, effective way of um, uh, limiting your exposure to risk of children mm -hmm. being involved in, in gaming. And it, as Andrew says, it's not always just about the initial onboarding. Uh, either face or, or fingers or, or hand or even uh, how quickly you walk around a casino. Uh, there are all ways in which you can look at uh, age um, analysis and age, age estimation and uh, feed into the whole life journey of your customers. So, Tony, would you would you then from from that suggest perhaps not not using it maybe at, at onboarding and perhaps using biometrics at later points of their life cycle? I think it's a bit of both. So you can use it as part of a body. I mean, there's other bits in terms of uh, if, I mean, for gambling and gaming, you do still have to to comply with regulations. You still have to know your customer and you still have to do anti-money laundering checks. And as part of that, if they're producing a passport or a driving license, you need to verify that the person that is in front of you is the person that is on that card or that passport using uh, self, what we call selfie matching, but mm -hmm. in, in terms of looking at that. So that it's a role to play in there. You may want to use uh, something like age estimation as a, uh, a filter. Um, so because you spend quite a lot of money on KYC and AML, why don't you do age estimation first to save you the money of doing that KYC check on somebody yeah. who's never going to pass it? Yep. So you could you could implement a, 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 a facial age estimation, say like well, a pre-screening. Before we put before we spend you know a pound, two pounds, whatever it is, on getting a full KYC AA logic, I want to clock you first and check that you're even <laughs> near to being old enough to being able to pass those um, those checks, and that ultimately could save gambling companies quite a lot of money mm -hmm. um, in their in their process of uh, onboarding. Uh, it would also, I, I would expect, it would make the journey much smoother. The uh, you know reduce the friction uh, yeah. in that journey because you could, you know, if someone look, doesn't look like they're old enough, you could prompt to them and say, you know, our assessment of you is you're not you're not likely to be old enough to do this. You know, come back when you're uh, over eighteen. And yes, you would also have to provide them with a a tool to challenge that. To say, of course, actually, yeah. Enough, it's, and it's not, it's not going to be something I ever have to worry about until exactly, it's it, it, it would, it would uh, smooth out that. So you can use biometrics to smooth out the journey as mm -hmm. well as in play contraindicators as well as part of the um, uh, verification process. I think the challenge for, for somebody like us, because if you're, say if you're owner as the operator or as the vendor, the area, they want certainty or as near as they can get it. So for me, that's... Uh, the layering in of approach. I think that latter point you made about tying it in with other yeah. areas. And let's face it, it's nearly always at the edges. It's going to be the challenge we have from an identity and understanding is always at that early, you know, maybe the 18s to 21 age group. And that's the way regulation looks at it. But for us, it, for it's always about layering it in uh, and to, to that process. So, you know, would you miss anybody, which is always the operator's challenge? Would you miss anybody if, if you sort of got it wrong at that side? But for me, it, it, all those things should be laid in somewhere, whether it's right at the front end or as an enhanced due diligence, uh, because this feels like it's not so much of it. It's that fraud at that front end rather than maybe sort of money laundering issues further down the line. But I definitely think there's a place for it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that adoption and uh, part of it that's going to be pretty important. 
Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Peter Hannibal, uh, do you want to jump in um, on this? Yeah, just to, just the, the point on the age estimation. Um, the, the applications where we've seen it, uh, there's always a human intervention following it because you can't necessarily rely on age estimation to be a definitive uh, yes, yes, no, you can gamble, you can't gamble. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's set at 20, 25, I think 25, then anybody under 25 has, has a, an intervention from a member of staff to confirm whether they are over 18 or not. Uh, but but uh, coming coming back to the earlier point about um, about regulation and, and regulators, the Gambling Commission have we've had some dealings with the Gambling Commission recently on um, self exclusion, and they um, when you get two sets of regulations, uh, you know the GDPR, two thousand and eighteen Data Protection Act, and the gambling regulations. Sometimes there's a conflict, and the Gambling Commission have built a, a quite a healthy relationship between themselves and the ICO recently uh, to clarify those areas where there's uh, conflicts can be resolved between the two mm -hmm. sets of regulations. Um, but the, yes, yeah, so, so in terms of our application for gambling purposes, um, for those who, um, who may be not too familiar with, with GDPR, um, you, you have, if, if you're a data processor of any sort, you should be registered with the ICO. And then you have to look at what you're doing with your processing personal data. Biometric data is, is a step above that. It's called special category data and it's got an, another level of compliance and, and legislation. Um, it's a complicated area and it, it, it does take a lot of work to, to make sure you're compliant. Um, but, but yes, the, there's... Um, yeah, I forgot, I forgot the question was now, but there's, there's, there's certainly uh, a new relationship between the two sets of laws and LCCP, uh, License Codes of Conditions and Codes of Practice that all gambling operators adhere to, have some things in there that you can re rely on for, for a lawful basis of protecting the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental part of gambling regulation, and that's a lawful basis for using or for processing data. Um, it's, I think it's good or important to point out what anonymous age estimation is as, as well. Um, so as you touched on, Peter, the definition of biometric data, special category data. So special category data essentially is data that you can use to uniquely identify a person. Okay. Um, and there's been some back and forth between us and some of our other people in the space with ICO about getting that definition clarified so when you do anonymous age estimation it's the kind of it's in the title it's completely anonymous we do not produce any data that can be used to uniquely identify um, a person so again and, and this is why we have to work together and work with regulators to get complete clarity on this we don't believe that anonymous age estimation falls under that um, special category definition plus plus you're, you're not storing anything either and yeah we, we don't and for facial or for age estimation of course you don't store data anything that we use in our in our products anything we use is still easy straight away so i'm fairly certain that andrew that the information commissioner's office have come around to that way of thinking they have uh, yeah. what they've said recently i'm a little bit less convinced them about the ed the european data protection board which is still on the fence with that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's, as you know, there's been a lot of the discussion and debate going on with them about the difference between a facial map, uh, which is data which you can then use to uh, effectively re-authenticate that that's the same person, with anonymous yeah. age estimation, which is not creating a facial map, it's simply doing a instant analysis and then uh, deletes and doesn't have any, uh, any ongoing uh, sort of data holding there. So it sounds like there's ways um, available for us to be able to positively use this facility and understanding what P Peter H mentioned about the, the legislation, even if it stays as it is, we could still build this into our journeys. We, it's just a matter of checking our terms, checking our consent and okay, so yeah, forth. It, it yeah. depends on the the provider or the solution provider mm -hmm. yeah um 
I can only speak Greek for ourselves. Um, so we can, we do everything, forgive the buzzwords, words, but on the edge, which means it's done locally on the device. So we don't send data off into the cloud to be processed elsewhere and sent back, because that could be another potential headache in regards of uh, data privacy. So everything's done on the edge. All the data for age estimation is deleted. No data is saved. Um, you can't uniquely, as as uh, Tony mentioned, in facial recognition, we 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 produce a number ultimately, what represents a, a unique person's face. That number does not get produced in the age estimation, so we don't produce any data that can be uniquely identified or associated with a, an individual. And I think that message has got to be clear because that's the area the consumer is going to be concerned about as well as regulators, is what would the consumer want? And for me, whenever we get into these conversations, it's it's all about they want that data to either be protected only to be used for the express purpose it's supposed to yeah. uh, or deleted straight away. Mm -hmm. So in those messages that come out as this drives towards adoption, that's just, just key. So whether it's edge or, or line, that that. Yeah message of how you're looking after the data is critical to to consumer buying. Certainly, certainly and the message to the consumer as you say is key because they know the gdpr standards you know just as much as we do um and the requests for information and so forth we don't want an increase in in those we want to make the player journey softer smoother and better than ever so um yeah yeah it's key it's interesting to look at the recent sandbox trials, so the Home Office ran some sandbox trials um, for the purchase of alcohol. So looking at um, mm -hmm. how improvements could be made to the Licensing Act of 2003, and several of us um, providers were on trials for starting maybe February up to October, where we placed our systems in supermarkets um, off licenses and gauge the response and it's you know it overall has been very very positive response back from age estimation technologies um especially when you like you say fiona make sure you bring the customer along with you that all the information they need is there we know they know exactly why it's been done why there's a camera here and maybe why they can see themselves in the camera and what exactly is being done with their images and their data Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think we've um, as well quite a lot on regulation, um, just because um, uh, I just be time conscious. <clears throat> um, could, could, uh, can anyone uh, maybe talk about um, uh, spoofing and how this can be prevented, and uh, how uh, to prevent people from uh, mimicking um, these uh, biological markers? Yeah. Happy to uh, do a bit on spoofing if you want. Um, and obviously, it's one of the things that we we test for. Uh, so just to explain what spoofing is first of all, it's, it's trying to trick the systems. Uh, so it's formally called presentation attack detection in the uh, international standards, but it's known commonly as spoofing. And it's effectively me presenting uh, either, um, a, a, I, I could print out a picture and just put it in the camera, I could have a, a dummy, uh, I could um, create a deep fake image. Um, so this is where you know I create a video and I, you, you, you've probably all seen these uh, memes that are going around at the moment where you've got Prince Charles with his dancing head singing a song. They're all, all over Twitter and um, like that, which is basically a deep fake uh, puppet. And I'm presenting that to, to the system. Now, there are, there are two principal ways in which that happens. Uh, the first is that I hold something up to my camera. You can see a picture of my daughter there as I hold it up on, the, on my phone. I hold it up to the camera and it will, it will uh, uh, whether it's able to detect that picture of my, my daughter on my phone as being not a live image, not a live person. Called That bit's called liveness detection. The second aspect is what's called injection attack. Now, an injection attack is where you uh, attempt to uh, trick your computer into presenting an image in the code. So you break into the code of the system and you, instead of, instead of it capturing uh, the image on your camera, on your phone, or on your laptop, it's actually a bit of code that you've done and it's trying to trick the system into thinking that it's actually um, your code. So that's a, that's called a video injection attack. So those two types of attack are tested for. 
there is actually um, quite a, uh, you might not know this, but there's quite a, a, a long established international standard and method of testing for presentation attack detection. Um, uh, it is something which has been around for quite a long time. It is now being applied by us to uh, age assurance tools, age estimation and selfie matching tools in the same way as it's applied for a while to you know, unlocking your Apple iPhone uh, using your finger or your, um, or your, or your face. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's something which is uh, a bit of a battle with the fraudsters. So, uh, uh, you know, as the uh, developers and vendors learn about how to prevent those attacks, uh, fraudsters come up with yet another method of, um, uh, of doing it or, or working their way around that system. So there's an ongoing uh, development. But I would have to say, of all the systems we have seen, uh, across everything we've tested, actually, um, they are all pretty good at liveness detection. They are all pretty good at um, video injection attack uh, detection. Um, and they, are, they, they, they all take that into account in terms of how they build their system. Tony, how would it actually work? Because from our perspective, that the feedback from our um, partners is, um, you know, if we touch on the liveness there, it's you know they are the, the criminals the fraudsters becoming more and more sophisticated they you know they often the organized crime groups have got a dev department you know um i went on a police workshop this week that touched on that so i i'd like to know and i'm sure that the people listening would is is how does it look and feel like what what do you do in your technology that can check that liveness so we can have the assurances that we're doing what we need to be doing. So, in terms of the testing, uh, we have a test laboratory, um, which is a, 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 a building where we have uh, the presentation, what are called presentation attack instruments and presentation attack series, um, and they include uh, like uh, because we it's not only the presentation of the person, it's also potentially presentation of documents. So we have a, a suite of, um, of, of, of like false passports and driving licenses and also all over the world. Uh, we have a series of different levels of instrument, uh, right from you know, a simple printout of a photo up to a manufactured mannequin head uh, mm -hmm. that we will, we, we will attempt to use. We also do things like uh, we will um, uh, put masks on. Uh, we will have a, a, a cutout of a mask that's you know, someone who hasn't done a very good um, they might just go, they're just looking for moving eyes. Okay. So there's like that. If the, if the eyes are moving, then there's like you have face. fun doing this. <laughs> so, they, so they cut up, we cut a mask out with them, your eyes cut out and you've got moving eyes. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, it's obviously for a very serious uh, purpose. Yeah. In terms of how the systems are developed to spot that sort of thing and, and what they will appear to you. Uh, I'll let the others who, who develop these systems talk a bit about that. But in, you, in the usual case, it will simply return to you a contraindicator. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that will be this person isn't apparently alive okay. or this person or, or it just won't give you a result. It will just say you're unable to detect uh, a face or it will say something along the lines of um, we were not able to um, uh, state to a required level of confidence that this person was alive, in which case you as the operator would then go, okay, what are we going to do about that? Do we just mm -hmm. reject it or do we do some sort of secondary investigation mm -hmm. or, or ask them to do it again or, or or whatever it might be? I'm sure the guys who, who produce these systems can talk more about the, the kind of output of their systems. But just just from, from our perspective, just really quickly, I think the, the liveness detection thing is really interesting because there's various ways of doing it. You can ask them to blink, you can ask them to move. The way the route we went was to have a video recording of all of this. Uh, ours was built by the people who built Skype, et cetera, but that for us was a more secure way of doing it. You can have it on, you can have it off. It's up to, to where you want to sit. But that ability to do you know, testing as you're going along but have that recorded in the background, we felt was always, always that safest way of doing it. So I think that everybody does it in a slightly different way, and the, the really techie guys on, on the call maybe I do can attest to that. But certainly from a user experience point of view, we just felt like that asking them to blink or asking them to do something wasn't a great experience. So we made that hopefully as, as less intrusive as you can get going mm -hmm. through that. 
Uh, but all those little things that are in there, that ability just to go, that point there about you can stick a photo on or you can put your daughters is a really valid point because the fraudsters, not the clever ones because they do it badly, uh, but the fact is that ability to check the document first and all the fraud checks that go with it, but then tie that in with some sort of lies, liveness or, or video technology just adds to that level, I think, of um, robustness that any solution can give you. It's come, I think it's come on a long way in the past, even the past 12 months. Maybe a year ago, um, they, they, it was called intrusive spoof detection. Mm -hmm. So you'd be standing in front of a machine, we'll say you wanted to play a game. Before it allows you to play the game, the machine will ask you to look left, look right, look up, look down, blink. So that's not a very good customer experience. But most, and ours included, our spoof detection has moved beyond. So the user themselves don't actually know that they're being spoof spoof detected. It happens at the same time, you could say that an age estimation would take place or just before, so you know when to continue with an age estimation. Um, just to jump in quickly, um, what, what would you say are the limitations of the technology at the moment and what uh, direction do you think future work should focus in? It's, it's like Tori touched on, it's, it's kind of like a painting the fort bridge you get to one end and you have to start back and go back again because things keep improving you keep getting more accurate um you know maybe two two three years ago we've had an actually maybe three four years now that's down to in about a year um again that's building on don't want to get too technical but building on good data sets and as good data um keeps me available 90 percent of my team's time is actually spent on cleaning data um, and I say cleaning data, I mean, you know, you, you train your algorithms. So how you train an algorithm would you show it millions of faces of a certain age. Mm -hmm. So it would learn what that face typically looks like. So when it sees a face it hasn't seen before, it can estimate the age right. So we spend a lot of time manually checking that ages are correct and that these images are labeled correctly. And that's where 90% of the work goes into that and actually doing that sort of donkey work. That can sort of improve your accuracy. Improving spoof and keeping up with fraudsters is another big challenge. Um, and just improving customer um, experience. This should be completely non-intrusive. Customers should really not impact in their experience. And again, the same for the um, operators. It should not be, it should be a tool that can be used. And a tool that can be used to help protect um, vulnerable people. I think that's why we kind of got into it and mm -hmm. we believe it's a, something that has great potential. I think it's, it's anybody on here. I, so one of the things I tend to, when I get into the other people that are interested in areas of identity is about the inherent biases that are built into facial recognition as we go along. It's less and less so now, because I do think the systems are much more diverse and much better than they were three, four years ago. But one of the questions always around that, that um, uh, the bias that's inherent in it so you know it's more likely to recognize me as a, a white male than it would be to somebody uh who's a black female for example um yeah. I, I it's interesting to get your thoughts on that. i think those problems are diminishing I do not get me wrong they've not gone away but i do think we, we've gone exponentially better than we were three four years certainly ago. that that's many years ago they, these were the, the data sets were available and the data sets were mostly consisted of white males yeah. So the system would perform best on white males. And counter to that, then yeah. uh, uh, females and different skin tones appeared to uh, not operate as well. But uh, I would agree. No, I think that that is a problem. Uh, well, the, the, the issue in relation to the training data sets is, um, is certainly massively improved. And there are now multi-million images that are going through, which, which it, there was a training. The remaining issue when it comes to skin tone bias, though, is that it's just the law of physics. I, I'm actually here, where I am today, is in a relatively dark room. I normally have quite a, a bright room, but I can actually change my screen. So if I turn my screen off, it actually has reduced the amount of light that is flowing to my face. Now, because I'm white and light skinned, that is not having as big an impact on the camera data collection as it does if you have a darker skin face and this is simply to do with the fact that less light reflects off darker surfaces than it does off lighter surfaces now you correct that by having more light it, you know you basically you shine more light on it but of course 
you know, everybody is entitled to um, access their games in their uh, in, in their bedrooms with the lights uh, down low, and so you've got to deal with that potential for uh, bias still remaining because of the physics of properties of, of light. But the systems have got a lot, lot better. Even in the, uh, since last twelve, even the last six months, there's been a huge step change in the um, in the in, in the, 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 the the overall equity and fairness of it. And, and um, uh, actually, tomorrow um, there's a, a workshop that's happening um, in in London about um, how you measure the effectiveness of age insurance uh, techniques. And there's a piece of work that's going to be happening that's been commissioned by Ofcom and the Information Commissioner's Office about all of that and bias and equity and fairness is all, is all part of that. So there's a, there's a whole lot of research going on to that as we speak and over the course of the next uh, the next uh, couple of months. I think that's an interesting point because a year, it's a few years back now we did a big project uh, on facial recognition in casinos uh, and we found yeah, the, the technology, the camera technology at the time uh, wasn't great, but it, it was originally to identify people that were already registered because you've got to get them registered first in that instance. But what we found is the lighting was, was two issues. One was the lighting, certainly in a casino environment and an offline but land based. And the other one is, which surprised me at the time, was everybody's looking down because they're on the phones. They were walking in the casino in a fairly badly lit area, uh, all looking down towards their phones. So that was one of the more surprising things. So that whole ability to create a nudge which will get somebody to look at. Certainly if we're looking at this from the context of a land-based environment, because I think if you're Fiona or, or myself or anybody, you're sort of used to these conversations in, a, in an online world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, it's the land-based, the retail outlets, all those conversations, whether it's self-exclusion or just tying you into a loyalty card, etc. That level of friction, I, we've always found with operators, whether it's the US casinos are here, that just by introducing what they perceive as a level of friction really turns them off at the, at the end of the day. Now, I think- Exactly. Uh, I think the, uh, the, 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 the home office sandboxes that Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, this is one of the critical learning points out here. Actually, on our screen here, we have a, uh, a great example of this because um, uh, we have Fiona here uh, who is in a, uh, a beautifully lit environment with a nice plain background. That's the sort of thing that computers like when it comes to analytics. Peter, where you are, you've got a very bright, uh, it's not obviously a nice sunny day where you are. It's shining across your face and you are getting a daily reflection across your face which computers struggle to cope with. Uh, Zach, where you are, you've got a very bright window right behind you, which makes the contrast of your face with the background also a little bit difficult to analyze. And where I'm in this, um, what I've heard described as a telephone box in a meeting uh, center in, um, in Brussels, where I am, I've got a horrible background, really terrible lighting, and, uh, and all of those things have a much bigger impact on the ability of the algorithms to do the calculations than um, we do. That's one of the reasons why in our uh, test center, we've got casino lighting, we've got pub lighting, we've got retail lighting, we've got strobe lighting. All of the tests that we do when we do um, uh, accuracy and efficacy testing of AD estimation systems are exposed to lots of different lighting. And I think one of the use cases for this, which I think is a very interesting use case, is, uh, and I think Andrew, you do this, uh, you, you may well as well, Peter, I'm not sure, but uh, is building the actual age estimation into a gaming machine, the, the, the fruit machines, the, uh, the, the, the slot machines, um, and actually having that facing the customer. Of course, that camera, little camera facing the customer is fine, but that customer is facing into what is a massive flashing box of light, which is going to fire all sorts of different lights at their face. So you've got to maybe uh, take that into account when you consider uh, a deployment of uh, an age estimation tool in a uh, built into a, a, a game which I, I know after you've done quite a bit of work on that in terms yeah, of how you've been working. Yeah, it's the big old adage bad it in, bad it out. So you have to make sure you, you're providing via the camera the best you can for the, the particular situation. We do have many tools within our products that enhance the image um, accounts for. Um, uh, various um, aspects that we know would cause bad data out. Um, mm -hmm. 
so yeah it's like tony said it is challenging to choose you can choo choose choosing the right camera is a, an issue but um again camera technology has even come on again a lot in the past couple of months that um, um it's interesting well, from the regulator's perspective is where you would put that technology so i get the conversation around it's on the machine but actually people walking in there they should be, for us it's always about if somebody comes on the premise or comes onto their website that's where the check should be once you're in and doing something yeah. on a machine i've just think mm -hmm. that's not the way forward certainly the, the americans and their approach to it and casino yeah. normally might do that but yeah we, we we made a conscious decision not to support like ip cameras so these are the cameras that are in the roof you can't do facial recognition if you can't see a face and that's the yeah <laughs> sorry just to um uh, brief, briefly interject um, I think we've reached the time um, for user questions, and um, the, the top question is actually um, about the quality of cameras. So I thought it'd be a good um, uh, good place to go off. Um, oh, yeah. to, to what extent do prediction results depend on the quality of the camera? For for well for us, we we can use any USB camera. So we usually and typically put out a camera that's like seven twenty p. We would recommend having good uh, low light performance. So in low light um, environments that the camera itself will produce good images. Yeah. Um, I think our experience is that it, the, the, the actual quality of the camera isn't as important as the lighting of the software that it's facing. Yeah. Well, even really poor cameras will still be sufficient to get an image. Um, but if it's badly lit, that's a, that's a significant issue. Um, but obviously, the more, the higher the quality of the camera, the more it can cope with that lack of uh, background lighting. So um, that, that would be tend to be what we find with the testing. Yeah. And we're not I talking think, about um, super was... resolution cameras or big 4K cameras, none of these mm. kind of fancy, fancy cameras. I think um, what's important from um, from our perspective is that the the consumer or the player is is directed with simple clear instructions because what what i've seen a lot of is um especially like the older players um especially i work for a, a bingo provider is um that you know they don't know how to take selfies so the younger generation find it really easy um but the the older generation they might just use their phone to play um so i think the way it's directed on the front end is, is really important for the for the player and and the operator and, and the, the other point comes back to the, what Peter was talking about earlier on is, is where do you want to make the detection? Because uh, a betting shop or a casino is an over 18's premise, so nobody should get through the door that's that's under 18 in theory. But it's far better, to, it's far more efficient to detect people at the point of transaction, because you've got a controlled environment, and but there's more points of transaction, obviously. But um, but you can use you can effectively use a cheaper camera if you use it. In that controlled environment i think you've got you've got the difference where you've got those uh, threshold offenses where it's an offense for somebody under the 18 to cross the threshold and you've got those where that isn't the case so like things like family entertainment centers um and most great service areas and places where these machines might be um, even to a certain extent pubs and places where children are permitted access where you've got that you haven't got the threshold offense you have the player offense at that at that stage so it's about using the right solution in the right environment yeah. and the right um, uh, regulatory environment but i would agree that uh, you know for a casino um you're you know as peter says you, you're principally that's a threshold offense so they shouldn't be coming through the door so your your verification and uh, age estimation should be at the point of entry to the premises for casino betting shop type places um but there are lots of places that gambling uh gaming machines are available that aren't threshold offenses uh, thank you very much, Tony. Um, just moving on now to the, um, the second most outvoted question. Um, I know we touched on uh, regulation quite a lot earlier, um, but this is once again about GDPR. So how does this it reflect on GDPR rules? Um, feel, anyone can feel free to answer this one. Well, we, we sort of covered that with the conflict between, potential conflict between gambling regulations and GDPR. Um, it, In all honesty, the, the ICO regulations are there and all of this is a, is a impacted by the ICO regulations. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I, GDPR is extremely unlikely to be the barrier to you getting compliance mm -hmm. right. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's not to say you can ignore it. It's not, you definitely can't. But when you're looking at the rules in relation to legitimate interest and, uh, and, and the things that you have to do to comply with regulation, GDPR isn't likely to be your barrier. Your barrier is likely to be somewhere else. You still have to make sure you've got your right privacy policy. You've understood exactly why you're doing. You maybe done some impact assessments. You've done the uh, the piece around if you're using legitimate interest and legitimate interest assessment. Legitimate interest is key, I think. Um, yeah, I but you, agree with I wouldn't. You. I wouldn't start by going, "Oh, is this going to be GDPR compliant?" Because you're you're in a this is a compliance environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, but equally, can't ignore it. But it's not it's not a main barrier. The, the only caveat I would add to that is if if you're if you're use, processing data and storing data for the purposes of protecting the vulnerable, I think Tony's absolutely right. As soon as you start using that data for showing people adverts and other things, then then you're in trouble. And I think that's the point was made earlier by Andrew is where that fits in with uh, marketing. The sort of the moment you introduce that, we all start backing off and go, that's not what it's there for. That's a really I think important point. The other one is very European centric from a GDPR perspective. Everybody has different things. But if you take that best of breed approach uh, and work to those standards, I think we're all all right. It's not it's not the barrier that stops this stuff working. There are very there are there are three very simple rules for compliance with GDPR. Number one, don't collect any personal data. Number two, if you do collect personal data, get rid of it as quickly as you possibly can and don't use it for something else. And number three is don't get a lawyer to write your privacy policy. And the reason for the last one is because you want, a privacy, you want a privacy policy that reflects what you actually do, not something that's trying to get you out of a legal hole. And so you should write, and you, the people who write your privacy policy should be the people that actually build and design your system. Get a lawyer to check it, but don't get them to uh, initiate it. That's my three simple rules. So you've GDPR. simplified GDPR paperwork policies documents to three rules. That's good. They all work. I like it. No nonsense approach. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, just to move on uh, to the next question. Um, uh, what kind of hardware is needed for this software? Um, it might be a, uh, yeah, what would you say? Well, I, I can speak about our, our particular product. Um, we supply the, the hardware and you can see it on our website. You can go see it and you see. So it's a small little USB dongle, essentially. So that runs what's called a NPU, which is a neural processing unit. So similar to a CPU, but the, the architecture is specifically designed to run neural networks. So neural networks are the brain that make all this magic work. Um, if you try to run a neural network on a CPU, again, depending on the network, but it would take 30, 40 seconds. Whereas when you run it on our NPU, you can it works at 10, 15 times a second. So for these, or for, or for our particular one, and that's why it can run on the edge as well. So, so a, a lot of these um, these um, approaches would need kind of very very beefy machines. And that's why usually it's taken to the cloud, processed in the cloud, and yeah. sent back to the. Certainly from, from my perspective, we were involved a few years ago now putting hardware uh, into one of the biggest casinos around. And that at the time felt like, right, I just think the future for just for the customer experience probably isn't that. Um, with Andrew on the, the cloud-based side, and I would say that from a SaaS provider's point of view, but whether that's taking that journey via a tablet or a phone rather than hardware, um, it, we're not there because I think certainly the US casinos wise, they want something to walk up to and, and all that. But I think longer term with the new generation coming through, um, the cloud's the way forward for me. Again, yeah, like uh, it depends on your application. Yeah. If you're a land based, um, yeah, you have a gaming machine, you want to add age estimation to your gaming machine. You very simple. I can install probably very simply you plug this into your machine camera in one end and other end into your machine and you've got an age estimation yeah. um, application that stays that's privacy compliant GDPR compliant I know and all data stays there and in, in your machine so um, okay. great well thank you very much um so I think we'll we just move on to our last question now um, which is uh, whether the system is scalable to multiple locations. 
And can you recognize people in multiple, uh, multiple locations? If you save the data only locally, how do you rec uh, recognize people across uh, different locales? So, shall I pick this one up, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. So, we, we th this is currently happening already with um, the national self exclusion schemes and where the data is held in the cloud and the camera doesn't store any data, it just references. Uh, Andrew will talk better to this than I can, but it digitizes the image, checks it with the with the cloud, and if the image is there, comes back with a positive ID. If it's not there, the uh, information is deleted. Yeah, so, so essentially for self-exclusion um, application, you could, you could, you'd have a central repository with all these we call face IDs. So these numbers that represent a person's face. Um, and then if you walk up to your machine or walk up to the camera, the device will capture your face, turn your face into a face ID and go and compare to the um, central um, central um, database to see if there's a match or not. So if there's a match, of course, an alert would be sent saying um, possible self-excluded person detected. If there's no match, the, the machine will just operate as usual. Yeah. I think the thing for me, Andrew, this is the this is the big gap in retail land-based environments. You can't. It's not sustainable to have a picture up put on a wall of somebody or to recognise. Exactly. Yeah. The trend is you know their customers, but the fact you can walk out of one retail environment and into a different mm -hmm. brand further down the road is not sustainable. Yeah. I think drawing to get it's interesting if you draw those land based and online self exclusion schemes because I've been involved in a couple, uh, then that's where the answer is. The fact is, the technology is out there to do it. How we engage with the customer and, and how people like yourself, Andrew, uh, uh, put these systems into place, the technology is there to do it. I just think the will and the, and the ability to pull those things together is key, it's certainly from a reputation and a trust point of view for the sector, uh, for the gambling sector. This is one of those key areas that really needs to be addressed for me. Yeah, you can you can add a, a self exclude person in one location, yeah. and within seconds, all locations then would know or would recognize that person to be self excluded. It's so, it's so just on, on this point, I, I would say uh, uh, take, a, take a little bit of care of the consideration of self exclusion and exclusion. Uh, so self-exclusion where the, the, the individual has effectively consented to being excluded for uh, perfectly good reasons in terms of uh, mm -hmm. wanting to control their gambling addiction is one thing. Exclusion, which is where the venue takes the decision to exclude someone, is a very different thing. And where that's tripped people up in the past, there was a case involving, um, I think it was the, I can remember around it, between Chippenham and Canterbury. I think it was Canterbury that the uh, the nighttime economy there had a um, a pub safe scheme that would bar people uh, from the pub from the pub if they got rowdy. Um, they had that linked to an ID system, and that ID system was shared networked. And what happened there was uh, somebody had a knife out, got a bit rowdy, got excluded from a pub in Canterbury uh, because uh, basically for that night got barred for the night as as happened. When they went out in their hometown in Chippenham, they discovered that they were excluded from all the pubs in Chippenham as well, uh, because the network had shared that exclusion across the whole network. Now, then you're getting into protection of freedom and you're getting into uh, the proportionality of whether someone excluded from one premises ought to be excluded from all. So there's a very key difference between self-exclusion by the individual and exclusion by the venue or the operator. Good point, I think, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, fantastic. Um, well, just before we wrap up, um, I think um, we were going to do another poll, uh, which is, um, do you think you become more likely to investigate biometric technology now, um, a for age verification and for uh, player protection? Um, yeah, well, um, thank you, um, everyone um, who's uh, contributed today, uh, Peter Hannibal, Peter Murray, uh, Tona, uh, Tony, Fiona, and Andrew. Um, I found it uh, very interesting, and I appreciate your time and insights that you shared with us today. Um, I'd like to thank as well Aaron and uh, Laura at Clarion Gaming for their hard work in organising this. Um, I would also like to thank Innovative Technology for sponsoring us here today. Um, as, made, as mentioned earlier, 
Uh, today's recording will be made available shortly after the end of the webinar. And finally, a big thank you for everyone who's tuned in, especially those who've asked questions and uh, most of your favorites. Um, our next webinar will be betting on customer centricity, um, innovation in managed trading services, which is taking place at 3 p.m. on January 25th. So we hope to see you there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.